Hi, welcome to ECNM Tech Talks, brought to you by ECNM Magazine. This is a series of how-to videos where we cover everything from basic electrical theory to the equipment that we install and maintain out in the field to the various codes and standards that govern their installation and maintenance. These tech talks are brought to you by ECNM Magazine. That's Electrical Construction and Maintenance Magazine. What you need to do, if you haven't already, is go to ecmweb.com. That's ecmweb.com and click on the menu in the upper left-hand corner. The first thing when it drops down, it'll say premium content. And you wanna click on premium content if you haven't already and sign up for the premium content. Here's why. You'll find not only these Tech Talk videos that we do, but you'll find tons of information related to today's topic, as well as a wealth of information all related to our electrical trade. And the best part, it's free. So click on that premium content link and sign up. I'm Randy Barnett, your facilitator for this Tech Talk video. I'm a journeyman electrician, electrical trainer, and textbook author. Today, we're going to talk about electrical lockout tagout. Now, why? Well, pretty obvious. The goal of electrical lockout tagout is to protect employees from machines, equipment, and process hazards. You'll hear different terminology as we go through the processes of lockout and tagout then. You'll hear different terms for procedures, hazardous energy control procedures, control of hazardous energy, lockout tagout. Remember, affected persons are those who may operate the equipment or machinery that we're locking out, even though they're not involved in the lockout process. Now, authorized persons are those who carry out the lockout tagout process. No matter the terminology, we just wanna make sure that a piece of equipment is not going to start in us when we don't want, want it to, right? And uh, we wanna make sure that it's not gonna become energized when we've got our hands in there and we're working on that equipment. Out in the field, we may say something like, hey man, make sure it's locked out, tagged out. Make sure it's dead before you stick your hands in there. The term for that that we're gonna be talking about today is called create an electrically safe work condition. The OSHA rules for control of hazardous energy or lockout tagout were first issued back in 1989. It's part 1910.147. And it's considered the standard for lockout and tagout. However, section 147 makes it clear that it is not applied to construction, to the generation, transmission, or distribution of electrical energy, or to those of us who are exposed to electrical hazards out on the job in facilities. Well, if you read ECNM Magazine, that's probably why you're here. And what do we do for a living? We do construction and we do electrical maintenance, okay? So, but there was a reason that OSHA didn't include those particular rules for lockout and tagout in the 147 rules. Okay, the specific rules needed for construction and exposure to electrical hazards wouldn't apply to everybody else. And so to put them in a the general rule would tend to complicate the general rules. So OSHA said, we're gonna put them in those particular industries where they apply. So the rules for control of hazardous energy, lockout, tagout for construction are found in part 1926 of the OSHA regulations. The rules that apply for generation, transmission, and distribution are in 1910.269. For the rules for exposure to electrical hazards in general industry that applies to most of us, those are found in part 1910, subpart S. When it comes to complying with federal OSHA, our state standards, we need to realize that the how-to methods to comply with the OSHA performance requirements are found in the NFPA 70E standard for electrical safety in the workplace. These how-to procedures appear in Article 120 of NFPA 70E are entitled Establishing an Electrically Safe Work Condition. And that's the, hey man, make sure it's locked out and dead. Now, Article 120 is divided into five different sections. The first section says you must have a written lockout tagout program in place. Then it covers the lockout and tagout principles. It goes into the lockout devices and the tags you use and the procedures you must have in place to complete the lockout tagout process. And finally, it gives us eight steps that we must follow 
in order to create this electrically safe work condition. The disconnect behind me is an example of an energy isolation device. Circuit breakers and disconnects are most commonly used for energy isolation. Uh, and it's to downstream equipment, right? So if we want to de-energize the actual disconnect itself, we would have to go to an upstream switchboard, circuit breaker, or whatever, in order to de-energize the disconnect itself. When I operate the disconnect handle, it opens the knife blades on the inside and only de-energizes what's downstream of the disconnect then. Energy isolation devices are required to be able to accept a lockout device. The lockout device has his special requirements whoops, as well. So we have a lockout device and we have a tagout device. Now, there are some provisions that will allow you to install just a lock or just a tag, but those are pretty rare. Generally, when we do a lockout tagout, we're gonna install both the lock and the tag as we'll see. We must have some method of identifying the individual who installed this lockout tagout device on our isolation device. So there'll be a place on the tag to put your name, or it may be a picture of you or, and your name or something like that. Uh, the key must remain in the possession of the individual installing the lock or the person in charge of the lockout, such as if you're gonna use a lock box. Now, the tag comes equipped with a grommet and uh, that must be capable of withstanding 50 pounds of force exerted at a right angle to the disconnecting means. Now the lockout tagout program itself is you've got to have a documented procedure. As far as individual procedures for a machine or, or piece of equipment, it's up to the employer to determine what is going to work best. For some general types of equipment, it may be best to have uh, one procedure for that type of equipment and then individual checklists for each specific piece of equipment. Some employers may use procedures with images of the energy disconnecting means for a specific piece of equipment uh, attached right to the machine itself. Bottom line is we must have procedures in place in order to accomplish lockout tagout effectively and safely. Now we group lockout tagout into two types of procedures. We have what we call the simple lockout tagout and the complex lockout tagout. Simple lockout tagout procedures involve only one person de-energizing one set of conductors and, and the worker is responsible for his or her own lockout tagout. In the simple lockout tagout, there's no requirement for written procedure for that specific piece of equipment that they are creating an electrically safe work condition in. Uh, the complex lockout tagout is exactly what it says. It's more complex. If I have uh, multiple, multiple energy sources, uh, multiple crews, crafts, trades, or employers involved, if I have multiple locations with multiple disconnecting uh, means, or specific sequences maybe I have to follow, or if, as, as often happens, the work is going to last beyond one shift, then I must follow a complex lockout tagout procedure. Now let's, think, uh, let's actually use a checklist like we're talking about then a written procedure to establish and verify an electrically safe work condition, for instance, on this disconnect. We're going to, and well, I should say it's not the disconnect, right? It's the piece of equipment downstream is where we're gonna create the electrically safe work condition. We're gonna do that by locking and tagging out this disconnect. So we'll take a look at the inside of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just simply gonna use the checklist that's in the list of eight items, in other words, that's actually in the NFPA 70E standard under section 120.5, process for establishing and verifying an electrically safe work condition. Let's take a look at it. The first thing it says is that I have to determine all possible sources of uh, supply to my equipment, of electrical supply. So keep in mind, we can have automatic transfer switches, ATSs, that can throw and operate, supply a piece of equipment, maybe from a, a standby generator under certain conditions. Uh, we can have battery backups and so forth for certain equipment, uh, for DC equipment that will automatically start supplying our equipment upon a loss of power. 
So there are different sources. We can have heat interlocks maybe and a switch gear, something like that, uh, that we also have to consider. So the best way to do that, get out the one line diagrams and go through them, walk down the equipment, determine what are all the possible sources of supply. Document that in your job safety plan. The second item it says is after properly interrupting the load current, open the disconnecting device for each source. Use your procedure, okay? If you don't, we're human beings, we're gonna forget things. So it says, after interrupting the load current, open the disconnect. So I'll go wherever the stop push button is and de-energize my equipment, turn the power off to my equipment, do a normal shutdown. Then I'm ready to operate the handle on the disconnect and throw the handle down. Now to do that, don't stand right in front of it. It's a good idea to stand off to the side and turn your head to the side and operate the disconnect. Do I need PPE to do that? I don't know. Follow the requirements of NFPA 70E. If your equipment is in normal operating condition, you may not need the PPE and then in order to operate it. Once we start to open that door though, we're gonna have to set up our barricades and uh, before we open the door, and then we'll wear all of our PPE that's necessary. Rubber gloves, for instance, to go in and verify the circuit de-energize. So that's another topic, of course, all unto itself, and we've covered before in our tech talks. But wear your appropriate PPE, follow all of your safe work practices then. And then it says, open the disconnect, which we've just done, and we move to step three. Step three in our procedure says to, whenever possible, verify that all blades of the disconnecting devices are fully open, or that dry type circuit breakers are withdrawn to the test or fully disconnected position. Well, this is a disconnect. So we'd be wearing all of our PPE, wouldn't we? All of our, maybe we need a face shield, I don't know. We'd have to look on the label or use the PPE category method to determine what is the safest way to open up this door. Okay. So to open it up, I'm gonna stand to the side once again and slowly open it. I slowly open it and I look for any signs of abnormalities. No smoke coming out, no rodents rushing out of there or anything like that. And then when I'm ready, I can go ahead and fully open the door. Now, right up here at the top, I can visually verify that my knife blades are open. That's still not good enough. I don't know if I'm getting a back feed from something coming into this disconnect that it could still be energized. So I'm gonna to have to take my meter and verify that there are no sources of power inside this disconnect. So that takes me to, to step number four, which it says release any stored electrical energy. Stored electrical energy, capacitors, batteries, examples of stored electrical energy. Information in FPA 70E on how to safely discharge capacitors. Step number five, block or release stored non-electrical energy. Well, I don't have any stored non-electrical energy in my disconnect or in my circuit that I would norm, you know, normally uh, in a situation like this, maybe where I'm just supplying a motor off of a disconnect, but think about a low voltage power circuit breaker. Are those springs charged when you rack the breaker out or you rack it out just to the test position? Um, you're gonna to have to verify that they are in fact discharged because you don't want those contacts in a breaker to go close when you least expect it. That could be very dangerous. Step number six, it says, apply the lockout tag out device in accordance with a documented and established procedure. So of course, this is that written electrical lockout tag out procedure that you must have in place. So I would assign my lock and tag, the tag on it says, Danger, the energy source has been locked out. Danger, locked out, do not operate, okay? All of those types of things on it. So I go ahead and I place my lock and tag on the disconnect. And I maintain control of the key or it goes into that lock box that we mentioned earlier. Step number seven is probably one of the most important, if not the most important of this whole process. It says that I have to take an adequately rated voltmeter and I'm going to have to test and verify 
that in fact, I get zero energy on the inside of that disconnect. So I would take my voltmeter and never assume anything. And it spells it out for me right in the, in the 70E procedure. And it says, the first thing that I do is I make sure that my meter operates safely on or properly on voltage. So I would set it to AC voltage and I'd go to something like a proving unit and make sure that my meter works properly on AC volts. Then I would go in and I would check from phase to phase and phase to ground on each one of my three phases. So I do A to B, A to C, B to C, and then I check from A to ground, B to ground, and C to ground, and make sure that I get zero on my meter. Then it tells me that the third part of this step is to go back to my source of AC voltage and verify my meter still works properly. And we've seen all of that done in a previous Tech Talk video. Now, once I've verified I'm in this, uh, I have no energy, I'm ready for my final step if necessary. And that is to install personal protective grounds. That would be step number eight. That could be to induce voltages. And generally, you know, we don't install personal protective grounds. Generally speaking, I say less than 480, or excuse me, less than 1,000 volts. However you might, so follow whatever your procedures are. And the installation of personal protective grounds, that's a separate, uh, it's an, I call it an art and science all unto itself, okay? And it takes a lot of practice to do it properly. But follow your procedures if it's necessary for you to install personal protective grounds. Also, I mentioned as well that when you are checking your circuit, if your circuit is greater than 1,000 volts, you're certainly not going to be using a multimeter on it. Uh, so there are provisions for a non-contact type of test instrument to be used to verify zero energy on the inside of your equipment at these higher voltages, right? So now I could take my PPE off and I could take down my barricades and I could close the door and go to work on my equipment. So those are the steps for creating an electrically safe work condition or performing an electrical lockout tagout. Now keep in mind, once the work is all done, at some point we've got to restore the equipment uh, back to normal, don't we? We've got to restart the equipment, put it back on the line. And really there are three basic OSHA requirements for that. It says the first thing you do is you make sure that the equipment is safe to restart. So of course, you'd have to make sure that it, your work is all done, all of your uh, tools, any parts, extra parts you have or whatever, are all removed from the work area and the work area is clean and ready to restart the equipment. The second thing you have to take care of is the employees, right? You have to make sure that all the employees are safe. You have to notify affected personnel, personnel in the area, move people away from the equipment if you're gonna restart it. Think about it. you've been doing maintenance or installation on a piece of equipment or something. First time you're gonna start it up, keep people away from it. And then finally, the third thing when it comes to the restoration of this equipment is, is that only the person who applied the lockout tag out device can remove that lock and that tag. Now, there are provisions for exceptions. What if we've had a shift change? Okay, what if that person no longer works for the company? What if they're out on another job and so on and so forth? All of those procedures must be detailed in your written hazardous energy control procedure or electrical lockout procedure then to make sure that you can safely remove a lock and a tag when a person is not. So that's it for electrical lockout, tag out, all in a nutshell, really, we barely scratched the surface. Always make sure you follow your company procedures for control of hazardous energy. And make sure you lock it out and make sure it's dead before you stick your hands in there. In other words, create an electrically safe work condition. So until next time, Work safely, and remember that this Tech Talk is brought to you by ECNM Magazine, part of the Endeavor Portfolio of Business Publications. We'll see you next time.